All right. Well, welcome to this next installment of our QC Conversations. Uh, my name's Dan Patterson, and I'm psyched to be able to have on our next guest tonight to open up a big question. Uh, if you're brand new to this channel, the heartbeat of questioning Christianity is really about connecting the Christian story to life's deepest questions. And this conversation series is an opportunity to be able to put someone in the hot seat who is an expert in a particular area in wrestling with the questions that you've been sending into our website and through the social media channel. And right now we are really in the midst of a turbulent global moment. We're still recovering from the global suffering, from being able to limp through a pandemic and trying to get back to some sense of normalcy, but so much more aware of the devastation that's happening around our world. We're seeing bizarre events unfold in other countries with religious tensions and its impacts on the freedoms, and particularly of those who are more marginalized, whether the women or people of other sexual minorities or children, and just the fears that are associated with what's been happening happening in Afghanistan. And so given the kind of questions that people have been sending in, I'm delighted tonight to be able to invite on our guest, Dr. Amy or Ewing, who's going to be put into the hot seat to field some of these questions. Now, Amy actually comes to us all the way from the UK, and uh, she's been a longstanding friend of mine and my wife, Erin. And so uh, I'll bring her on at this moment and say welcome to Amy. Hi, Dan. Well, lovely to see you. You as well. It's great to have you here on our channel and so glad you can join us for a conversation. Thank you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to, to be with you and um, looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me uh, maybe fill our listeners in a little bit on your background for those who have never heard of you. Uh, Amy is a Christian speaker and a theologian. She has a wealth of experience really wrestling with many of the hard questions that most Christians probably don't want to be asked by their friends or family members, the things that are a little bit more hard to think through. Uh, Amy is globally traveled and has spoken in some pretty auspicious places, actually, places like the UK Parliament or on Capitol Hill over in Washington, even I hear in the West Wing at the White House. But now you're going to have to add to your bio that you've been part of the QC podcast online as well as sort of the key opportunity <laughs> of your speaking career. <laughs> Uh, and Amy is actually a really accomplished, Amy's a, an accomplished author too. So she's written a few really, really fascinating books. Certainly the bestseller, Why Trust the Bible, which is one I would definitely commend to you in answering a ton of the big questions that people often have when it comes to making sense of the scriptures and how it answers life's deepest questions. But she is also written another book, But Is It Real?, uh, which is exploring a whole lot of questions around whether faith is more than a psychological crutch. So those are two ones that are in my library that I'd recommend you pick up. But tonight we're going to be having a broader conversation later uh, on uh, the podcast about her brand new book, which is Where Is God in All of the Suffering? I'll make sure you can all see that. Uh, definitely worth picking up as sort of a short series um, with a number of other authors picking up on these really important topics. And I think for our particular cultural moment, this one is hugely key. Um, but Amy is in fact a doctor. She has her PhD at Oxford University, not a medical doctor, but a doctor meaning she spent more time in books than anyone cares to admit. Uh, and Amy's particular area of study has been uh, doing a PhD in theology at Oxford University and a focus on Dorothy Sayers as well, if I remember correctly. Um, do you want to fill us in a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, Dorothy L. Sayers was a kind of public intellectual in Britain in the 20th century, close friend of C.S. Lewis and someone who was a brilliant writer um, and broadcaster and who um, managed to speak about the Christian faith and the questions of culture in a way that was extremely relevant and accessible in her day and obviously doing that as a woman. So um, really interesting character from from history and it was a joy actually to to read um and read her stuff and really study her and think about her contribution to to the christian faith yeah very cool. Uh, well, I'm sure people will probably be Googling Dorothy L. Sayers now to fill in more of that picture, but definitely worth picking up. And particularly on some of the things we'll talk about later, has some great contributions as well. But uh, Amy, you and I have known each other for about 10 years, which 
probably ages us both a little bit, um, but have had the chance to do events on a number of different continents around the world. And, and every time we hang out, I learn a little bit more about your story and find it fascinating. And so before we dive into the conversation, sort of in women and, and Christianity, uh, I wanted to just let you have an opportunity to fill in uh, a particular story. So I remember uh, a while back, you were talking about being a relatively young Christian, but having an opportunity to go over to the Middle East and actually to speak to some members of the Taliban about the Christian faith. Can you just tell us a little bit about that experience? So I can't actually hear you at the moment, Amy. I'm not sure what happened. Strange. I still can't hear you. <laughs> Is it um, the, have your headphones just clicked in? No. Hmm. I think your mic's just cut out, sorry. Not yet. No, it might be worth unplugging it and just using the um, microphone in the in the thing. Sorry. No, I still can't hear you. It's not us. Just quickly check this, sorry. All right, how are you going now? Can yeah, I think now? it's work. It's back in now. Sorry, apologies okay. about that. No, it's fine. I've put it onto the um I've just put it onto the computer one. So. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so tell us about that <laughs> Afghanistan experience. Yeah, so it was nineteen ninety six and I was studying theology at, at Oxford as an undergraduate and part of what we were doing was studying Islam as well as, you know, study all the great faiths. And I'd become interested in this little known movement who had taken over Afghanistan with a very sort of extreme form of Islam. And so a small group of us managed to get um, uh, a letter from our student newspaper to say that we were the Afghanistan correspondents of the Oxford University newspaper. And we got visas to go into this war zone. And you know, we were all we were all Christians and felt led by God to do this, partly um, to learn and to listen, and partly to share something of what we believe in contrast to, you know, the religious worldview of the Taliban. And so um, it's actually a really long story, but there was a whole series of quite hair raising and, you know, depending on your worldview, miraculous slash coincidence, yeah. um, incidents that enabled us to get into the military headquarters of the Taliban and secure an interview with the top brass, who at that time were um, the education minister, the foreign minister and the religion minister. And there were about two or three others um, who were part of that. And it was an extraordinary uh, experience on a number of levels. One of them was that the Taliban previously had refused to allow um, any Western women to even be in their presence. So the head of UNICEF at that time was a woman for that region and they'd refused to meet with her because she was female. So it was quite extraordinary to, um, to actually get into their military headquarters. And we had also felt, um, I'd actually had a dream in advance of, of the, the day of the flight um, that we took Bibles and gave them as gifts and um, not really known for their pluralism, the Taliban. So that, that kind of felt rather risky, but we did it. Wow. We, had, we, had, um, we had Bibles with us. And so um, we had a few hours, I think probably about three hours in their military HQ asking them questions about um, their worldview, about their theology, about the influences on them. Um, about why they were doing what they were doing. Um, and then um, we had an opportunity to share our worldview with them and to speak a little bit about who the person of Jesus is in, in real contrast to 
um, to, to the ideas that they were propagating. And at the end, we they were all armed heavily with Kalashnikovs and actually the war was still going on. They'd taken about three quarters of the, of the country, but there were still skirmishes happening and you sure. could hear gunfire and stuff. But at the end of the interview um, meeting, one of our team, actually my now husband, said, look, um, we've brought you a gift and we think this is the most precious gift that one human being can give another human being. It's our holy book. And then our other friend, Miles, said, yeah, it's it's the Bible. And um, we, we sort of, there was a kind of deathly silence, let's put it that way. And then um, the religion minister who styled himself the keeper of the Holy Quran, the education minister spoke English and was doing all the translating. The religion minister began to speak and you could see that he was moved before we understood the words he was saying. And there was this sort of exhale in the room of, oh my goodness. And he said, I know exactly what this book is and I've been praying to God for years that I could read this book. Thank you from coming from the other side. Yeah, of the world. that's incredible. I wanted to read. And um, and then everybody relaxed and the education minister said, oh, can you give me this book in English? Because I'd like to read it, not just in my own language, but also improve my English. So he ended up coming back to where we were staying. We hadn't brought our English Bibles with us. He came back to where we were staying, at which point, the staff in this guest house um, <laughs> get nervous quivering with fear because these people were just so brutal but there he was you know to get his english copy of the bible so that was a pretty um a, a really formative experience for me um on the one hand of hearing from directly from the mouth of the leaders of an organization of a worldview that was really shaping the geopolitical landscape of the world yeah. to hear from the horse of <laughs> mouth sorry that's my dog she <laughs> for a i'm just gonna let her out i'm so sorry. all good well we love dogs over here in australia we're basically a, a country of dogs so always welcome <laughs> sorry it's um, fine yeah so to hear from to hear from the horse's mouth, not not a straw man version of what they believe, mm. not you know someone else's interpretation, but why do we believe what we believe? And to really engage with, with the ideas and the commitments that, that people have, and to see and experience that the Christian faith and the person of Jesus is relevant to everyone, you know, even people that that we might, I might write off and think they're never going to be interested in the person of Jesus or, you know, they are beyond a reasonable kind of conversation. And all of those presuppositions that I had were just smashed. And um, I guess, you know, in the, in the sort of subsequent 20 years in my, in my life and my work, I've often had the experience of talking with people who were coming at an issue or an idea from a totally totally different perspective and you know that's been enormously enriching um and it's also been a real privilege to to try to seek to introduce the person of christ to people who think he's not of interest to me um he's totally other and away from my from my life and the way i see the world um yeah so totally obviously so interesting at the moment, yeah, obviously at the moment, really sad to see what's what's happening in Afghanistan. And um, it kind of brings a lot of that story sort of flooding back. And of course, yeah, there, it was. Not... Yeah, go on, sorry. It was certainly what, what sort of prompted the, the question for me was just sort of wondering yeah. your heartbeat right now, seeing, having been there before, seeing sort of the un events unfolding and the sadness with which so much of the world is, mm -hmm. is looking on and just wondering, you know, what is the relationship then between religion and good for the world? How yeah. do we make sense of that? Yeah, but actually in Afghanistan right now, the house church movement is really, really growing. We're in touch with with um, house church leaders there. And obviously there's enormous suffering. They are being targeted and hunted by the Taliban. But there are also people who are kind of former jihadis, former committed Taliban who are hearing about Jesus and changing their minds. And so... Mm. Um, it matters what we believe really matters doesn't it because mm. it shapes our 
Um, it shapes the way we build our nation. It shapes the way we treat our fellow man. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, there's a number of people here in Australia that would be of a view that Christianity doesn't necessarily have that much of a better track record than organizations like the Taliban when it comes to the treatment of those who would be more marginalized in uh, in patriarchal societies. And I remember maybe five years ago now, you came out to Australia and gave a series of lectures framed around women and Christianity and whether or not Christianity is good news for women. And indeed, I think there's a chapter in your book on why I trust the Bible kind of honing in on this really relationship between women and the stories in the Bible. And and sort of given that you're a woman, uh, given the increased sensitivity that we have in our global moment right now to the tendency for men to oppress and to do awful things to women, uh, what is it that draws you to Jesus? Mm. Thanks, Dan. That's a, um, a really important question for me as someone who as you say, obviously is female and is a committed Christian. And I think you make a dis you made a sort of distinction in the question, which is really important. And that is between, you know, how institutional religion that has taken the name of Christ or Christendom or whatever has organized itself. Uh, there's a distinct, um, a very big distinction between that and who Jesus actually was as the gospels recorded both his words and his actions and actually a distinction between how institutional religion has behaved towards women and how the early church organized itself and so um for me when we look at the person of of christ we see someone who was radically countercultural in his approach to women in a culture where women were not allowed to learn they were not allowed to certainly um, sit at the feet of a, a rabbi or a teacher and Jesus invited women to be disciples you know that is clearly there in the gospels we see Mary sitting at his feet we see women named as his close disciples in Luke's gospel and then you see that women actually play the primary role as witnesses of all the central elements of the Christian faith around the identity mm. of who Jesus is so um, the, what, what, you know, theologians would call the doctrine of the incarnation, that's the idea that God actually enters space, time and history in a person in order to reveal himself to us. So Jesus is fully human and fully God. That's the incarnation. The primary witness of that, the primary teacher of the church of that doctrine is a teenage mother, a woman <laughs> called Mary, who's probably 13 years old. We only know of the incarnation of God because of the testimony of a woman. Mm. And then you come to the sort of second most central important thing about Jesus. And that's that, that Jesus um, was, was perfect. He lived this amazing life. And then he dies by crucifixion. The Romans crucify him. And through his death, he actually offers humanity forgiveness. He identifies with us in our brokenness and our sin through his crucifixion by the Romans, you know, AD 33. And that aspect of his life, his, his crucifixion, is primarily witnessed by women. The four gospel writers all agree on that. It says the male disciples um, mainly deserted Jesus. John is actually positioned there somewhere in some of the narratives, kind of far away. But the primary witnesses to the details of the crucifixion fact that Jesus's clothes were sort of gambled over, the fact that blood and water separated when the Romans put the, the spear in his side, the words he spoke, seven statements he makes from the cross witnessed by women. Mm. So we're taught about the death of Jesus. We're, we're, we're told of Jesus's death first and foremost by women. And then of course, thirdly, the resurrection. This is probably more well known that the women are the first to witness the empty tomb that Jesus's body is not there. Now, however we, um, you know, understand what happened after Jesus died and, you know, Christians proclaim that that empty tomb has a meaning and the meaning is that Christ was resurrected, that he's overcome death and all of that. The fact that it's women who were first there, who witnessed to it, you know, that's often used as a sort of 
reason to believe historically that it's true because you'd never position in an ancient narrative women as your primary witnesses because their word had less value in a court of law and all of that so if you were making it up you'd never do that so that's important but stand back and think about the other significance theologically of the resurrected Christ, Christ victorious over, over death, over sin, Christ able to forgive us, you know, he's vanquished death through that crucifixion. And what that means for the Christian life, the liberty that we can experience, the forgiveness that we can experience in this world, the way we can face suffering and death because of Jesus, primarily witnessed and taught to us by women. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it, that you basically don't have the Christian faith without women telling us about the incarnation, women telling us about the crucifixion, women telling us about the resurrection. And then, you know, we could go on and look at how women are positioned in the early church, women like Lydia, you know, first leader of the church in Philippi, or women like Phoebe, women like Junia. So throughout the new testament then as well we have this position of women you know engaged in the church in the christian faith and so it's kind of really sad to me that that has been lost because i think it's unique actually in in any other faith that i've studied or heard of you don't see women positioned in that in that kind of way mm. so how how then I mean, that's a beautiful vision, but how do you make sense then of the history of the church, which has had at times a tendency to be more oppressive towards women or where the Bible has been used to justify people being trodden on or treated as the second class mm. citizen within the kingdom of God? What do you make of then that record that the church carries? Yeah, um, I think what I make of that is that as as human beings, you know, when we gather together, we bring with us, you know, our prejudices, our, our brokenness and becoming a Christian doesn't cancel out all of that aspect of ourselves. So a gathering of Christians is a gathering of forgiven people, but it's not a gathering of perfect people. Mm. And so, I mean, you can look at, you can sort of look at things historically and you can see, you know, the emergence of Christendom, you can see emergence of sort of political power and religion coming together. Um, in the in the sort of later early centuries of the church, if you like, and then you can see certain things that happened, you know, during the Middle Ages. Um, but I suppose I would want to say, you know, we can't we can't cancel any of that out. It is true that there is this awful stuff in the history of the church, and actually the gospel gives us an explanation for that: that we are broken, prejudiced, pride-filled people. We need the forgiveness of Jesus and we need the sanctif what the Bible calls the sanctification, that process of being made like him. And there's evidence of that need in every church. There's evidence of that need in every Christian individually. But that doesn't actually take away from the fact that in every era of the church, you also see examples of women leading. So if you take, for example, this, the country where I live, UK, you know, it was a, it was, it was Celtic um, believers who who brought the gospel to these islands. You know, there's a, a beautiful place you, we go on holiday called St Ives, which is in Cornwall, and that's named after a woman called Aya who brought the gospel to Cornwall from Wales, from um, wow. Ireland. You know, got on the boats. Or we can look at the city of Oxford, where you know I've lived and worked for years, and um, the the sort of central kind of Christian historic communities are around the cathedral there at Christ Church. There's a church called St. Audits and Ebbs. And those were planted by women called Frideswide. <laughs> or we could take the sort of great revivals of, of um, faith that have have happened and you know one example here again in the uk sorry i know i know you're in australia no, and i was actually born in <laughs> australia um but you know you could take that that movement that happened um in the 1800s and two key leaders in that in the salvation army william and catherine Booth, Booth and she was the she was the preacher so it's not all one story i don't want to say mm. that the church hasn't been sexist. The church has been horribly patriarchal, I believe has taken certain passages, you know, out of context. 
and ignored other portions of scripture that's that's out of the brokenness and darkness of our of our hearts but it isn't all that way there are also kind of glimpses of of, of another way and the way of jesus which was to include and to affirm uh women in the most in the most wonderful and beautiful way well, let's say there is a young woman watching this right now, maybe a teenager or someone studying at university or even a young mum and are trying to make sense of the Christian story for themselves. And they've got these barriers or these concerns based upon some of this history. What advice would you give to them? Yeah, I think my advice would be um, to, to look beyond the institutions and to look beyond perhaps, you know, negative portrayals that we might have seen in history and to ask the question are those negatives reflective of the original are they um co a coherent outworking of who jesus actually is and who he showed himself to be in history and i think if we do that if we kind of take away the sort of layers of rubbish that have been built up and we look at what is actually original um, what we see is something really beautiful and glorious and something that uniquely um, affirms us as women. It says that you know, God created humanity, male and female, in his image. So to be a woman is to bear the image of God. Hmm. Like our womanhood is something essential and something sacred. And I think actually in culture at the moment, um, Perhaps if we're, we're following maybe a more naturalistic or atheistic worldview, it can be hard to answer that question. Where is the sacredness of my womanhood rooted? Does it matter? Does male and female, do these categories actually really exist? And the Christian faith gives us um, a really beautiful answer to that and a co coherent sense of meaning in what it means to be to be a woman not just in relationship with Christ but also um, as we sort of examine who we are at the deepest level that that that's rooted in God's image mm. Yeah, it's a beautiful thought. And, uh, you know, we've, we're fond of saying in a bunch of the videos that we've done on this channel before that so much of what's wrong with the church's history, it, the problem isn't that they're being Christian, it's that they're not quite being Christian enough, that they're falling away yeah. from the way that Jesus yeah. has sort of composed a beautiful life. And so uh, maybe maybe he'd be a great place to start too. Uh, well, let's, let's yeah. switch gears then to your fantastic book uh, on suffering. Um, I really love the way that this is set up for those who might be new to the Christian story story and are wondering, this seems to be usually the biggest barrier. How could I believe in a loving God? Uh, and there are a ton of books out there. And I really want to get into what makes your book a little bit unique in this way. And so could you fill us in maybe what drew you to write it? Maybe some of the particular experiences that you were having out of which this book was birthed? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so I was actually really reluctant to write on this subject because I think... Um, it's just so deeply, profoundly true of all of us that that we suffer and that we're gonna we're gonna all suffer. And I think there's a real danger um, when we begin to speak about this this subject, actually from any worldview, whether we're Christian, whether we believe in God or not, that we can kind of speak about suffering as this sort of blob that needs to be explained, as if it's, you know not as as as, pay, as painful yeah. and visceral as it actually is um and so i think i waited 20 years to to really put pen to paper about this it's something that i've really thought about um journeyed with people as well i've gone through uh, suffering in my own life and um a couple of experiences that i think have really played into this have been Number one, journeying with women who've experienced rape and sexual violence and feeling that um, often sort of Christian explanations of, of suffering didn't really address that or couldn't really address that. And I just felt if it can't address that, then, you know, let's all just go home. <laughs> it, 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 it has to be able to speak to experiences of violence, domestic violence and sexual assault, which are just so incredibly 
unfortunately numerically common um, in our world. Uh, I think the second sort of big thing that really loomed large for me was there was a um, there was a fire here in the UK that took hold of um, a building in London that was was um, in, in West London. It's called Grenfell Tower and um, nearly 80 people lost their lives in that fire and it was it was on TV um, everybody was watching this this fire burn it was very very traumatic for the nation and you know children died it was in a very poor area of London and it was to do with this cladding that had been put on the building to sort of make it look more presentable because you know it's quite near wealthy area and 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 people died in a very very horrific way and um my husband and I were invited because we were involved in a sort of project that had been working in that community. We were invited to come on the Sunday. So the fire happened on the on Thursday night and we were invited to come on the Sunday to sort of lead um, a, a kind of public service in the streets um, for the people who'd suffered. And that was an incredible privilege. I mean, I embraced and hugged people who'd lost family members in that fire. Um, but something that really, really um, touched me very deeply was that um, a reading had been chosen and it was given by a member of, a reading was made by a member of the community. It was from, from, from the Psalms and it, it talks about how God is close to the brokenhearted. And there was just over a thousand people and we're outside and the you know, you can see the building, it's blackened with, with smoke, the fire is now out, but we're there hearing these words of a Hebrew poet spoken about a God who is close to the brokenhearted. And then um, the passage goes on and there's this line in the Psalm that says, and the wicked he will cast to the ground. And then there's a, another verse that happens, but before the person reading could get on to the next clause of this piece of Hebrew poetry, applause began to ripple through this crowd. So you've got over a thousand people, some of whom have lost their loved ones, including children burned to death in a fire. And people who don't know God, who don't you know, call themselves religious are applauding the idea that there might be accountability for the wicked. And that just, it was just a very, very profound experience to, mm. to be there and experience that. And it spoke to me of a truth, a truth that I think the Christian faith uniquely articulates that we are not just a bunch of cells or atoms here by chance that human life really matters. It actually matters that a child that I will never meet, that I have no evolutionary predisposition to care about their survival. It matters that that life was lost because they are more than a bunch of atoms or cells, that that, that person's life and all of those people's lives really, really matter. And that people, all of us, actually, regardless of whether we believe in God or not, we feel anger and we feel outrage when we see injustice in this world and when we see the poor or the innocent suffer and burn to death or die in some horrible way. Um, we feel outrage, but what is the explanation for that outrage? Can our worldview explain why we feel that outrage when we experience evil and death? And I think that the Christian faith gives us a framework. It gives us an explanation for our human feeling about reach. It is God's image in us. And whether we believe in that God or not, our life is still precious because we've been made in his image. Mm. Um, and then of course, there are other things we can say about a God who comes alongside us in suffering. But that was a very, very profound experience for me. And I saw in the reaction of people who don't believe in God, a truth that the Christian faith actually gives us, lived out, I saw it expressed 
in that outrage in that community and in that desire for accountability and justice mm. Yeah, it feels like there's been that voice for the last couple of years echoing around the world, that deep voice of protest. And the Christian yeah. story you're saying validates that protest, that this is not yeah. the way that things should be, that something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. So, so for those that haven't said, seen the book yet, it's actually beautifully set out in the sense that I appreciate the tone with which it comes. But you have a series of chapters that touch on subjects that so often would get overlooked when people are talking more generally about what's known as the problem of evil or the problem of suffering and, and yeah. how it relates to, to Christianity. And so you've got a chapter in there on anxiety. You've got a chapter in there on violence. You've, you've even got a chapter in there on other forms of, of mental health. There's just so many yeah. uh, sort of interesting things that you touch on natural disasters. Uh, if there was one takeaway message one broad thing you wanted readers to walk away with when it comes to the suffering that they experience mm -hmm. or that brings them to tears in the world what would that message be that's so hard Dan. because <laughs> as you say um i really wanted to to sort of acknowledge that suffering isn't a blob like your mum may die of cancer or you may lose a child or you may go through the experience of of rape or sexual assault or you may be struggling with suicidal thoughts and or you may be wondering how could god be good and tsunamis or viruses happen and suffering is so multifaceted um that anyone kind of saying okay there is a god and this is the answer to this question needs to actually address the specifics of suffering and so i suppose the one the one thing i wanted people to take away were, would be would be that really that that there um, isn't one thing <laughs> yeah and I, I think that's that's well, helpful though that because yeah. The, the, in yeah, the exactly. sense that it, it says what um what the christian story has to offer it's rich it's, it's not deep. monotone. Yeah. It really does yeah. take seriously these these questions yeah. that people Who have. Yeah, and the specificity, the specific situation that you may find yourself in, that that matters, and that there is a God who who loves you. And I suppose you know, like, but but to pan out, I think the one thing that I'm trying to say that I don't see written in a lot of other books about suffering and and faith is that our very outrage, our very sense of devastation when we go through something horrific, um, that that actually points to a deeper truth about who we are, that our lives are sacred and that you know we've been made in the image of this God. So one of the examples that I, that I might use around sexual assault, for example, you know, if you speak to someone who's gone through the horrific and devastating experience of rape, the physical tearing of flesh, the bruising of the arms of having been held down, um, you know, trigger warning, you know, the, the, the physical act of this, the physical sexual act is one aspect of the suffering that that woman goes through. But the, every woman who has experienced anything like that what they will tell you is that that's a relatively small aspect in other words the the emotional the psychological and the sense of one's personhood having been violated in some way is is far deeper so if we view the world through a naturalistic lens and we think that everything that exists is purely physical, that there is no sort of spiritual dimension and that even our emotional responses to things are actually chemical or biochemical. Does that explanation of the world, is that enough to hold a person, a human being's experience of sexual assault? I don't think it is. I don't think mm -hmm. a physical ex um, explanation of the world is enough to explain that yeah Why it's really helpful and so devastating because who we are as a person has been violated and who we are as a person is sacred there's something truly truly profound um about that and that that explains why suffering hurts so much 
Yeah, um, I really appreciate that insight. Yeah, I, I think it's the it's the other problem of evil. You know, if you get rid of God from the picture of our world, if you opt for an orphaned universe, then you bump into the challenge of the evilness of evil and the wrongness of suffering. Yeah. Um, and how yeah. do we make sense of that, those deep dimensions of our human experience yeah. without making them two dimensional rather than 3d or black yeah, and white rather than color is not enough yeah. yeah yeah no i appreciate that that's really interesting well let me press you if you don't mind on another yeah, one in particular yeah. because so often uh you know i speak to a lot of students and they'll often say well i've heard about this idea of free will that the reason why god would make a world like this where people can have meaningful relationships and a meaningful role means that he had to give us free will and so that explains why there might be suffering in the world because we broke the moral law and ended up being broken by it. But how does that make sense then of natural evil or of what we might call natural mm -hmm. disasters? I mean, we have a, a cultural memory long enough to think back yeah. to 2001 and the big South Asian tsunami that wiped out a quarter of a million people or the pandemic of yeah. the last year, or you actually opened the book telling the story of losing one of your dear friends to cancer. And, and just mm -hmm. to wrestle with these uh, realities of sickness, of natural disaster, or what Stephen Fry famously said in his 2015 interview, mm -hmm. you know, bone cancer in children, what's that about? Uh, how is it yeah. the Christian story answers this stuff that doesn't seem to be connected to free will or human choices in any obvious causal sense? Um, where is God in, in the midst of that kind of suffering? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, a, a really profound and important question. Um, and I, I sort of spend really two chapters looking at this, one on sickness and you know illness like cancer and that sort of thing, and one on... Um, natural events like tsunamis and earthquakes and viruses. Um, so forgive me for being brief because obviously there's a massive amount to, to say about this. Um, and I think kind of historically um, the, the, the church or Christians have, have kind of looked at this through, through two lenses, I guess. One would be to say that um, what you talked about about the free will defense that that idea that in order for you know a world in which we can make choices a world in which love is possible uh, we we have to have a will and god doesn't constantly come in and override our will and that our human moral choices have more than an immediate impact on ourselves and the people immediately around us. So, you know, earlier on, we were talking about domestic violence and a, a man's use of his will to abuse a woman is a classic example of someone, you know, using their will to hurt someone else. It's very easy to draw a line between the moral action and the pain caused. But we all know that we live in a world in which um, people's moral choices have bigger picture ripple effects. So you know, our, our decisions in Western cultures, for example, to, to want that very cheap iPhone has a, has a ripple effect um, on, you know, the, the standard of living and the experience of injustice of someone on the other side of the world. And so historically, Christians have said, you know, actually the narrative in Genesis that speaks about human exercise of will speaks about an impact of human moral choice on more than just other human beings, but that there is a tangible impact actually on the environment, on the earth. And even before, you know, scientists were talking about climate change, where we can draw a line between human selfishness and an impact on the environment, Christian theologians were saying that Genesis 3 here speaks of the earth sort of falling in a sense with us. So our human moral choices have this kind of tangible, but we can't quite draw a direct line between which choice caused, you know, which natural event. But th there's this mysterious connection between our selfishness and a negative impact on the earth. And so um, uh, that might be how as Christians, we would think about something like bone cancer in children. And we would think about, you know, my stepmother-in-law dying young of, of breast cancer, that, that sickness and something going wrong with genetic codes, um, experiences of illness have, have come into our world as, as, a, as a result of, of our negative moral choices. 
Now, um, you know, that's, that's sort of one way of looking at, at it. A, a second and complementary and parallel way of, of looking at it, and this is sort of, I guess, you know, most typically um, argued by people like Professor John Lennox and, and other people who are kind of more elite scientists, and I just, full disclosure here, I'm certainly not an elite scientist, I'm not a scientist at all. Um, but what people like John would say is, that when you look at, um, at the the way that the Christian faith speaks of this world coming into into being of a good God creating this world, that actually includes all kinds of natural processes like plate tectonic movements, with, like um, earthquakes that cause the beauty of the mountains um, that we see around us, even like um, things like tsunamis, which which are just a part of how this world came to be. And they are part of that good order of creation. What has gone wrong is our connection as human beings with the natural world. And so we could look at something like the tsunami and that you mentioned, and we could see, well, you know, animals did actually have some kind of warning system and did withdraw from from that shoreline and they knew but our connection with our environment has been fragmented and broken as human beings as part of the world falling as part of our moral choice and so tsunamis and earthquakes aren't wrong or evil in and of themselves they're wrong and evil when they kill people when they harm people and then we go back to the idea well why does it matter that a human life is lost? Why do we rage against this great injustice mm. if we're just a collection of atoms? We do because every life lost is precious. And that explanation actually is 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 rooted in God being there, not him not being there. Yeah. Um, we could say something similar about viruses. You know, over 90% of viruses are good and are needed for the flourishing of life. You know, it's a very small number of viruses that bring harm and so you know the the explanation if you like that the bible gives for that is that ultimately that is rooted in the moral choices that we as human beings have made not in god wanting to harm us or god wanting this world not to be good and actually again then really briefly sorry that the bible then also talks about creation groaning and longing for resolution and as human beings, we, you mentioned it, Dan, we have this sense that this is not how things are meant to be um, and that, that ultimately God will set things right. And so when we look at natural disasters, that's like this groan, this, this longing for there to be no more death, no more suffering, no more tears. Um, and that that longing, too, points to a truth that that will one day be the case. Mm. Uh, I, I really appreciate that two-tone approach of the broad sweeping explanations that you can be a thinking person reading the scriptures and reflecting on the what's gone wrong in the world and that there are some meaningful ways to, to be able to explain our sense of what's gone wrong according to the Christian story, but also then in zooming out, not losing sight of zooming in and seeing the suffering and the grief of real individuals and their worth and value and yeah. dignity as, as a human being and holding those two things, I, I just think that that's so helpful. Um, let me switch gears a little bit. So let's talk about practical impact of, of things. So um, for a lot of people, when they go through these disastrous moments, it tempts them to want to give up on belief in God, to run towards a secular alternative or just assume that God isn't there or that he doesn't really care. And, and my sort of read is that doesn't really fix anything. You know, um, the suffering mm -hmm. remains, the grief remains. It, it kind of just sucks out hope but I'm, I'm interested to to ask you a bit more of a personal question so um you know you share throughout the the book a number of personal stories of of suffering and uh, you know people who live in parts of the world who have daily reports of those who are being mm. brutally murdered around them and so this isn't some ivory tower escapism but my own my own touch with this i remember uh, my wife and i uh were pregnant when i was still studying with you in oxford um uh, many many years ago and we lost that first child to miscarriage uh, and then had a similar experience maybe 12 months later. And these were somewhat medical anom uh, medically anomalous. The uh, sort of feedback from the doctors were, we're not sure if you're going to be able to have 
kids after this second sort of miscarriage. And I remember coming over to England to do some events with you at a time where that was just a very tender thing in our experience. And uh, I want to ask you about how being a Christian, having this story, changes how you face the uncertainty mm-hmm. and the suffering and those unanswered questions. Because I remember mm-hmm. there was just this beautiful experience of walking out of the office uh, in Oxford there with you and you just pulling me aside and saying, hey, let's hope for this together. I'm with yeah. you. I'm praying with yeah. you. I know things are tough right now, but let's uh, let's just lean in and trust the goodness of God. Mm-hmm. What is it that mm-hmm. the Christian story offers you in the face mm-hmm. of all of this suffering that people are enduring around the world that you would want people to grab onto? Yeah, I really remember that. Um, such a strong memory. Um, uh, that's, um, again, a really, really profound, profound question. I think um, one of the dangers as a Christian who believes in a loving God is that when we go through suffering, we draw the conclusion or we're tempted to draw the conclusion that God doesn't really love me because he's not answering my prayer and he's not um, he's not st- stopping this suffering. Um, and you, you kind of, you think about yourself that, you know, someone that I love and if I had the power to intervene, I would. And so there, there can be this tendency to, to sort of profoundly doubt one's own relationship with a loving God and that can be very very disorientating experience and so I think the first thing I want to say to anyone going through that is to say you are not alone in going through that like we can maybe feel judgment from other Christians or or, you know like we're failing then as a Christian somehow if if we have that wobble and that's why I wanted to say to you you know, because I've been through miscarriage as well myself. Um, I don't want to put it on you that you need to keep hoping in this situation, but I want you to hear that as your friend and sister in Christ who loves you, I want to contend for this mm. for you and, you know, kind of be with you in this in this suffering. Um, so I think the first thing I would want to say is that the Bible actually gives voice to people saying, where the hell are you, God? And, you know, it's pretty strong, the language in the Old Testament prophets. They're swearing there's all sorts, you know, and we can kind of, the church often sanitizes that. But actually, the Bible gives voice to people saying, how can you abandon me in this way, God? Where are you? Do you love me? Do you even exist? And then other sort of processes of, of lament, of devastation, and putting that into words to God um and i think that's really beautiful and yeah. really powerful and just honest and then, for those who have yeah, those feelings it's like, yeah exactly um and then i think that sort of shift of expectation what do i think the christian life is and what do i think relationship with god is am i visualizing this as you know if god loves me he will stop anything bad happening for, to me actually that's the american dream that's not the christian faith and so um beginning to draw a distinction between deep joy and a sense of meaning in life and a sense of being known by the creator of the universe and being loved and not suffering like disconnecting those two things and i think that's that's something that happens over a period of years and as you go deeper in faith as you meet other people um and then i think probably the third thing i'd want to say is that god can actually meet us in our suffering because of jesus jesus was stripped and shamed and abused and beaten jesus went through betrayal by his one of his closest friends um jesus experiences this this extraordinary kind of broad remit of of human suffering and the bible says that that demonstrates that shows that god loves us and until you've really suffered and actually met god in a time of suffering i don't know that you really really know what that means but to, to actually experience god's love in jesus when you suffer is a is a really beautiful thing and i think there is real hope in that 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and in your mind, um, you know, given the kind of two broad stories that much of the West is battling between this resonating Christian heritage that's passed down for centuries now, that there is something more than just the suffering, that death is not a full stop in the sentence of reality. And then the secular story, which says, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow, we really do die. <laughs> Um, how do how do you find the that that opportunity or the the question mark of eternity? How that refocuses some of these questions around mm-hmm. suffering as well? Yeah, I think I think that that's really profound because I think that our human experience of suffering deeply and profoundly tells us that that secular narrative isn't true because. You can't say that to someone who's escaping domestic violence, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. You're just a bunch of cells, so, you know, just go through life, that's it. It's not adequate to hold what it means to be a human being in this world, including in a suffering world. Um, So the writer of Ecclesiastes says, you know, God has put eternity in the hearts of people. Like, there is something deeply in us as human beings that there is more to life and that our lives really do matter in a bigger grander scheme than you know going out for drinks with with our friends and maybe dying tomorrow and if you go to the funeral of someone who does die tomorrow who you care about you know that that narrative isn't true that life really does matter and i think that points us to Jesus, who who says, you know, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry again. Anyone who believes in me will never be thirsty again. Jesus isn't talking about physical bread and water. He's he's talking about um, a deep truth about what it means to be human, to hunger for eternity, and that that hunger for meaning, that hunger for significance, that that thirst for life can can be satisfied in knowing him and that's not just an instantaneous one-off thing coming to know him that's like a a journey a glorious journey through this life even including when we suffer and ultimately beyond the grave Mm. yeah i appreciate that Uh, well thanks so much for giving us an insight into the book i'm sure uh, we've put down in the show notes where people can pick that up um, so they can go and read more for themselves personally Uh, but i just wanted to give you an opportunity for a bit of a parting word so say that there's someone who's watching this who is not yet a christian they're still figuring out what they think about life's deepest questions and how to make sense of their own experience what would be your parting words of encouragement to them yeah thanks dan um I think I'd want to say that um, you matter. And if that truth that you matter on a deep and profound level resonates with you, then um, that truth is kind of undergirded by God's image in you. And um, Jesus speaks about in the Bible, he speaks of a sort of image of standing at the door and knocking. And it's like, imagine, you know, your house and there's a knock at the door. And you actually have a choice about whether to open that door and let the person who's on the other side of it in. Um, so if, if you if you resonate with this and you sense, I think I do think that life matters, um, I, I wanna encourage you to consider opening that door to Jesus. Consider maybe saying an agnostic's prayer, God, if you're there, reveal yourself to me maybe taking a step further and saying something like, Jesus, I am open to you. Will you show yourself to me? Maybe picking up a, a gospel, one of the four kind of accounts of, of the life of Jesus in the New Testament and beginning to explore coming to know him. So um, if you have that sense as you're watching this, that maybe there's something here I'm intrigued, then I'd encourage you to to pursue that, to open that door. Mm, I appreciate that. Well, Amy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on for this QC conversation to dive into questions around women in Christianity and the suffering of our world. So thanks for joining us at a brightly hour in the past from the UK. 
<laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me, Dan. No worries. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us for this one. If you're interested at all in any of Amy's books or just to learn more about her talks and her ministry, you can uh, find her website just down in the show notes. We'd love to be able to send you all of those links. Uh, we're going to be having a upcoming QC conversation, diving into questions you've been sending in through our website and our social media channels, really about the Bible itself. It's a large and confusing book. Who put it together? Why should we trust it? And we're going to be getting on a fantastic Bible. Bible Scholar here from Australia uh, for that next conversation coming up soon. So thanks so much for connecting the Christian story to life's deepest questions and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.